So we got a glimpse of what Tennessee could look like for next football season. So let's make the case. Tennessee 10-2 in 2024. I'll tell you how that could happen here on a Thursday Locked on Balls. You are Locked on Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome into your Thursday edition of Locked On Balls, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every single day. I'm your host, Eric Kane. Thanks so much for being here. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Game Time. You can download the Game Time app, create an account, use the promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. We're going to make the case for Tennessee ten and two. Not saying Tennessee will be ten and two, but we're going to make the case here in segment one. Who said it best from Citrus Ball post game? Tyree West had some zingers. We're going to hear from him, plus what Josh Hopple had to say about James Pierce and, of course, quarterback Nico Iamaliava. And then we'll get into our Josh Ward segment on a Thursday, typically Ward Wednesday, but that's going to be here on a Thursday show. So let's go ahead and get into it. Um, again, not saying Tennessee will be 10-2, and two, but 10-2 puts you in that conversation for not only a Southeastern Conference championship, an appearance potentially, remember, ditching divisions next year, you're going to take the two top teams in the SEC from the 16 teams out there with the additions of Oklahoma and Texas, and those two teams will play for an SEC title. 10-2 and two obviously puts you in that conversation to uh, to be up there. Now, you likely got to be 11-1 and one or 12-0, and 0, but 10-2 and two puts you in that conversation. But more than that, if you're 10-2, and two, and even in my opinion, 9-3 and three will be in that conversation of on the outside looking in or right there on the borderline, depending on where you're ranked and depending on the quality of wins, strength of schedule, and all that, which we know Tennessee will have both of those if you win those games in the SEC and, of course, the strength of schedule. But 10-2 and two will, I'm not going to say 100%, but 10-2 and two in the SEC, you're likely going to be in the in the 12-team college football playoffs. So the question was asked on the VolQuest podcast on a Thursday. Um, you go check that out after you know, you, you, you watch Locked on Vols and Locked on SEC. You go check out the VolQuest podcast. But the question was asked to make the case for 10 and 2. And I thought that was really, really interesting. So let's make that case for 10 and 2. Again, not saying it's going to happen, but here's kind of, you know, how I view it. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to share the screen here. You're going to see the uh, 2020, 20, let me try that again. You're going to see the 2024 uh, football season. It starts with Chad New get home. Okay, that's going to be a win. Then you have a neutral side game in Charlotte, North Carolina against NC State. NC State was not a bad football team. Finished strong in 2023. Got a significant upgrade at quarterback um, from, from the kid from uh, Grace McCall from Coastal Carolina. So that's going to be a challenge for sure. I do think Tennessee will be favored to win that game. I do think Tennessee will win that game. But it's not going to be a blowout like you saw against Virginia at a neutral site, in my opinion. It's going to be a football game. But I think Tennessee can win that game for sure. And I like that game away from Neyland Stadium because though – it's not a true road environment. It does kind of get you in the mindset of, all right, practicing here in Knoxville, travel day, practicing at Everbank State or Bank of America Stadium, walk through all that type of stuff away from Neyland Stadium. So it kind of gets you in that rhythm, kind of gets you in that flow of kind of a road game, even though it's a, a neutral side. Now, there'll be much more intangibles for a true road game. We'll get into that here in a moment. But I like Tennessee to win that game. So, you know, Tennessee's at 2-0. At and o. Um, Tennessee comes back home against Kent State. Tennessee should win that game 3-0. and and, and then the test truly starts, right? New into the SEC, storylines galore. Josh Heupel going home to Oklahoma. Um, first SEC game for Tennessee. First SEC game, I believe, for Oklahoma. It's going to be a big week. First true road game. What does Oklahoma look like? You lost your quarterback. Jackson Arnold came in, struggled a little bit in the bowl game, but he did some things as well. He's going to be your quarterback, former highly rated prospect, I believe a five-star. And, you know, what's that going to look like? Tennessee is going to be well-positioned on the offensive line, going to be well-positioned on the defensive line. Tennessee, you like what you got in quarterback. You like what you got in the backfield behind you, behind um, a couple of uh, injured, you know, offensive linemen. Tennessee ran for 232 yards in the, in the Citrus Bowl against Iowa. Just pretty stout, really stout, especially considering what Iowa's defense was on paper and what Iowa did against the run and Blake Corum and against Michigan. 
in what Iowa did all season long and allowing only four rushing touchdowns. Tennessee had three rushing touchdowns. So anyway, I mean, again, I'm not going to sit here and preview this matchup. That's a toss-up game, but I still like Tennessee's chances. It's just, can Tennessee get ready to play away from home? Tennessee struggled in 2023 in road games. It did. Does Tennessee have a road problem? Well, it lost to South Carolina in 2022. It lost to Georgia in 2022 on the road, okay? It lost to Florida, just wasn't ready in September. <laughs> it lost, to Georgia, lost to Florida on the road, all right? Lost to Alabama on the road when you led 20-7 to seven at halftime. Did respond to get a win against Kentucky on the road, so that was good. But I'm not sold that this Tennessee team is at its best on the road. It's been kind of a multi-year thing. What's Tennessee look like in his first true road game? It's going to be a toss-up, but I, I think Tennessee can win that game. Then you get an off week. All right, you get an off week, and then you're back on the road, the first of two off weeks. Then you're back on the road at Arkansas. What in the world does Arkansas look like? You know, new, new offense, new offensive coordinator, of course, former head coach, now offensive coordinator, and your, your quarterback that's been there for what feels like a decade has gone, and, and, and he's going elsewhere. You know, solid run game, of course. Um, but 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 a lot of that's gone as well. What does Arkansas look like in a, in a year where Sam Pittman is coaching for his life? Again, a road game. If you can handle the road environment, if you can handle all that stuff that comes with it with a young quarterback, and the Oklahoma game will tell us a lot, of, of course, about, uh, about that, about handling the road environment, especially with a young quarterback. I think Tennessee's better than Arkansas, and I think Tennessee can win that game. But again, I'm not going to sit here and say they're gimmies, because nothing's a gimme in college football. Nothing is for sure a gimme in Southeastern Conference play. And nothing's a gimme for Tennessee on the road, especially considering where it's been the last couple of years. But I think Tennessee can win that game. Okay? So if that were to happen, you're sitting at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 0. Oh. Then you come home against Florida. Florida was so bad this past football season. We know Tennessee struggles with Florida. We know Tennessee struggles with playing in the Swamp. But the last win over Florida did come at Neyland Stadium. Florida is bringing back a quarterback that played pretty well in 2023, despite what I what, what I thought going into the year, and despite you know what he did at, at Wisconsin for four years. Um, but he had a pretty pretty solid season, so that's huge for the Gators. But I still think Tennessee is farther along than Florida, and much like Sam Pittman, you know Billy Napier, Sun Belt Billy, a lot of people call him, is going to be coaching for his life. That is a that is a game that you have got to win if you're Josh Heupel at home. You have got to win if you lose that game to Florida at home. I mean, he's not on the hot seat. I'm not saying he's on the hot seat, but things aren't going to be well, in my opinion. And again, this is January the 4th. We are going to have this conversation several more times over the course of the offseason, but just kind of getting a glimpse right here, trying to make the case for 10-2. and two. Tennessee should win that game. Tennessee better win that game at home. Okay, so if you win that game, you're 6-0. No. Alabama's going to be at home third Saturday in October. We know about Alabama year in and year out, like Georgia we'll get to in a moment. Recruiting classes on top of recruiting classes on top of recruiting classes. You built the team the right way, okay? Jalen Milrose coming back at quarterback. You know he's going to be in the Heisman conversation. That game is going to be a tough one. Toss-up for sure. Against Kentucky, probably an upgraded quarterback, even though we haven't seen Brock Vandergriff play an awful lot. Probably going to be an upgraded quarterback, considering Devin Leary really let a lot of people down this year. After being one of the best quarterbacks in the country at NC State in 2021, starting the 2022 season off strong, injury plagued, and I don't think he ever really recovered. He was not the same guy in 23 that he was in 21 or 2022 prior to the injury. But you get a quarterback that has a lot of potential. You have a lot of skill, Barry and Brown, Dane Key. What does that offense look like? It's at home. Tennessee wins against Kentucky. Tennessee usually always wins at home against Kentucky. I think that's a game that you're going to get. In my opinion, Tennessee will get Mississippi State, though it did get a transfer from the a quarterback from the transfer portal. You know, new look team under Jeff Levy. Tempo, tempo, tempo. But I think Tennessee, where the roster is, it's farther along. Then you go to Athens, Georgia. We know that we know the struggle that's going to be. Of course, you got uh, you know quarterback coming back for another year. We know where that team is on the offensive line, on the defensive side of the football, and everything. That's going to be a tough one. UTEP at home, that should be a W, and then Vanderbilt on the road should be a W. So my point is this. Sure, there are toss-up games. At Oklahoma, is going to be a toss-up game. Arkansas is going to be a tough game because it's early in the season and it's on the road. Florida's, you have to call it a toss-up game because Tennessee struggles with Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. But Tennessee certainly, in my opinion, and things can change, and we still don't exactly know ex exactly what the roster is going to be, but Tennessee can win at Oklahoma. Tennessee can win at Arkansas. 
Tennessee can play with Georgia on the road, in my opinion. Tennessee can definitely play with Alabama at home, in my opinion, though those two would be the losses if I was picking them right now. And Tennessee better beat a, a, a team in Florida that you're better than roster-wise, in my opinion, and you're playing at home. So in my opinion, Tennessee very much well could be 10-2. and two. And don't forget, you know, after that um, Alabama game, you have an off week at the end of October to prepare for the stretch of Kentucky, Mississippi State at Georgia, UTEP, and Vanderbilt to finish off the season. So I think it's very realistic that Tennessee could be 10-2. and two. Am I predicting that right now? No. It's January 4th. Okay, I'd like to see spring practice. I'd like to see exactly what this roster is going to look like. However, um, I do think it's very possible that Tennessee can be ten and two uh, for the twenty twenty four season. And if you're ten, if you're ten and two, you're not only knocking on the door to be uh, you know down in Atlanta for a college for an SEC championship berth, but you are also knocking on the door heavily for a college football playoff appearance in this twelve team era. So, um, what do you think? Make the case for 10-2. I'd love to hear what you got to say at underscore Kaner and at Locked On Balls. More to come. When we come back, we're going to say who we're going to we're going to visit. Who said it best? Citrus Bowl post game coming up next, right here on Locked On Balls. Do you want to tell you about our friends over at Game Time? You shouldn't have to worry about when you're going to buy tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast. It's the easiest way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy, also theater events near you. We talk about it all the time. Thompson Bowling Arena at the Food City Center, not only the home for the men's basketball team, the Lady Vols, the volleyball team and all that, but monster truck rallies, comedy show, concerts. You can buy all those tickets, last-minute deals, lowest price guarantee over a game time for the 2024 season and for 2024 altogether. You're running late, last-minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals as well, plus the lowest price guarantee, cancel uh, event cancellation protection, and job loss protection. They have your back. Game price has deals on tickets up to the start of the event, even an hour after the event starts. It's the perfect place to find last minute seats. So I encourage you today, go to the Game Time app, create an account, use the promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, guys, welcome back into your Thursday edition of Locked On Vols. We'll have Josh Ward coming up next in segment number three. Uh, But I did want to visit uh, some of the best quotes, in my opinion, from uh, the post-game media scrum over at the Citrus Bowl. Yeah, we know Tennessee won 35-0. We know Nico was okay through the air, really good on the ground, four total touchdowns. His Again, I'll say this again, his command of the offense, no pre-snap penalties, nothing seemed to ruffle his feathers. Nothing seemed to get him to be anxious in the pocket, even when, you know, the offensive line and the running backs give up six sacks. Um, I was really impressed with what Nico looked like, uh, uh, you know, in the Citrus Bowl. Who else is interested or who else was pleased with what Nico did in the Citrus Bowl? Obviously, his head football coach, Josh Heupel. Here's what Josh Heupel had to say about Nico's performance. Here's what Nico had to say about his performance. And towards the end of this clip, a lot of people asking about redshirt. How does redshirt work and everything? Well, Nico and Josh Hoppe both comment on kind of how the redshirt process works. Give this a listen. I believe he's going to be a, a great dynamic playmaker and uh, know that. Um, I thought he handled himself really composed um, all day long. Um, subtle things of, you know, breaking the huddle, communication inside of the huddle, controlling the run game. Uh, his eyes were in the right place. Um, <clears throat> great to see a young guy go out and perform in that way in his first career start. Um, there's a lot of things that Nico can continue to grow and, and will continue to grow in. Um, you know, the challenge early in the football game was to tell the guys playing at a really high level around him too. I didn't think we played as well as we were capable at times around him. But we got great confidence in, in him and in that quarterback room. It felt great, man. Um, finally to, you know, play a whole game. Um, I haven't done that in a while, so. Felt good to get back out there and, you know, get my feet wet. Um, but, yeah, man, I'm just proud of the guys and how they played. The defense played, you know, a tremendous, a tremendous game. And um, O-line did good. Receivers did good. And, uh, you know, I still think there's a lot of room for us to get to get better. So at what point in the year did the red shirt conversation kind of start for you? And kind of what was your reaction to that kind of being your path for year one? You talking to me? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, Nico. Yeah. Um, yeah, I never really, really had – Red shirt in my mind. Um, 
I really just, you know, I really wanted to learn this whole year behind Joe. Um, you know, get a year of experience just learning under my belt. Um, but, yeah, no, nah, red shirt really never crossed my mind. End of the day, for the quarterbacks and the guys at every position, you know, you don't have a, like, listen, you are strictly going to red shirt and won't play in anything other than the four games until you're on the very end of the season because of, you know, the way the game unfolds and the injuries that take place. And, you know, Nico's been one play away the entire season from having to carry the load the rest of the way home, you know, and, and uh, <clears throat> you just continue to fight and grow as a, as a competitor. I'm really pleased and proud of the way that he has handled his preparation every single week. And I think he's gotten better throughout the course of the season and understanding the urgency in that preparation. That's a huge part of the reason he went out and played the way he did today. You know, I like that they both kind of explain how the red shirt process works. And and again, I'm not trying to sound like I'm all knowing because I'm certainly not all knowing, but like I, I know how the process works, but I, I do believe the common fan doesn't, you know, back when I played college football, uncle Rico, allow it, please. Um, there was not the four game rule. So, you know, there were some certain situations to where if you play like a percentage of that first game or what, I don't know exactly how it worked, but there was a case to where if you went in for injury or you went in for a series or a certain amount of plays in like that first week or two that you could still redshirt. But pretty much before the four game rule, if you weren't going to play like, like you were, you were redshirting. If you played, you couldn't redshirt. So the coaching staff would go in with the idea of, okay, this is a redshirt guy, this is a redshirt guy, and still knowing, like, you don't follow waiver, you know, in preseason and say, hey, this guy's going to redshirt, he can't play no matter what. You go into the mindset of the season and he's going to redshirt, but if injuries, like Josh Hoppel just said right there, occur, and if your numbers are limited, then you might be forced off the bench and go in and play, thus burning your redshirt. You don't technically file for a redshirt or award at a redshirt until after the season is over. So, anyway, and now with the four-game rule, I mean – Again, you can play in four games. And so it's really easy now to enter every single season with a loaded roster, 110 guys, nobody's redshirting. And then, as Hypo mentioned right there, towards the end of the season, game or two left, you start to evaluate, okay, well, this guy's played three games, a little bit of defense and special teams. We'll let It would just make sense for him to, if opportunity presents itself, to get some run in, the, in, in one of these final two games, but not both. Just because why waste another game running down on kickoff when you can get a whole year if you need it. A lot of these, like Nico, if Nico's everything that we think he's going to be, that redshirt year is not going to matter because he's not going to be here. He's going to be in the NFL. You know what I'm saying? Um, but anyway, that's kind of how that works. And a reminder, bowl games don't matter um, because you're seeing situations with opt-outs and, and and everything. Bowl games don't matter. I love that rule because um, a lot of these guys are forced to play and you don't want to burn that red shirt. So anyway, I like that they kind of explain that. Uh, but you heard what Nico thought of his performance. Good to get back out there and play a whole game. You heard what Josh Hoppel had to say about it, how he's been proud of his preparation and all that. Guy that shined on the defensive side of the football, accounted for two touchdowns. Yes, defensive end, edge rusher, James Pierce. Here's what Josh Hoppel had to say about James Pierce and who he is as a player in the future ahead. Yeah, uh, James got a great football future in front of him. Um, he's a great player right now, but uh, uh, really believe he's got a chance to – to be extremely special. And, um, you know, for him, uh, just continuing to grow in his understanding and football IQ as we continue to move him around and put him in positions to win uh, is going to be extremely important as we go through uh, this offseason. Uh, he's dynamic. Uh, you know, he's got multiple moves to affect the quarterback, uh, but there's still growth in, in some of those fundamentals and, fundamentals and uh, can continue to grow in, in uh, you know, how he defends the run. And, and he's doing that well, but uh, there's still some, some growth there. And I say all of that. Uh, he's a dynamic playmaker for us, um, but uh, he's got a really rare and bright future uh, in front of him. I mean, I, I said it on yesterday's show. If you're a Tennessee football fan and really a, a college football fan that, that stays in the know on who's going to be good year in and year out, if you're viewing Tennessee as a fan or objectively, how in the world can you not like what's to come in 2024 with the way Tennessee finished this season, quarterback Nico, pass rusher James Pierce? There's a lot to be excited about. Plus, and then if you're a fan, you follow the team closely, you know Tennessee's bringing back the line of scrimmage, Okay. Tennessee is bringing back a lot of skill play, getting Brew McCoy back, getting transfer portal additions and all that. Yeah, again, I'm not, there, there's holes. I mean, there's deficiencies. There's, it's never going to be perfect. Um, 
Tennessee's got to find a left guard. Tennessee's got to find two tackles that can stay healthy, all that and more. But if you're just looking at it from the outside, 2024 Tennessee Volunteers, Nico, James Pierce, offense, defense. What is not to be excited about? And why not Tennessee to make that 12-team playoff? I, again, that's kind of going back to what I was talking about in segment number one, making the case. There's, there's, there's a lot to like about what's to come for Tennessee in 2024. And that brings me to Tyree West. Tyree West. What a quote. Tyree West, the first time talking to the media. Tyree West, probably the last time talking to the media. Listen to a bunch of these zingers he threw out there on his performance, on the defensive line play, on Nico, and what he's calling for next year. Um, this is some good stuff. Again, I left the uh, the questions in there. It's kind of hard to hear a little bit. But get a load of Tyree West, who had the game of his life, had a really, really strong game, and who Tennessee expects to be a big part of the 2024 defensive line. Tyree, there's some there's a spot up there for you to maybe earn a starting job. Do you think this was a statement game for you in any way? Yes, sir. Definitely my coming out party. There's definitely going to be more. How do you think this affects, like with all the guys coming back, How do you? what do you think the, the, the defensive line could be next year? We're gonna be we're gonna be a nightmare. I ain't gonna lie. We got a lot of people coming back. We got Big O. We got a lot. We got Dom. We we got a lot of people coming back. So we're gonna be good next year. Tyree, what's it like watching James Pierce go to work? James James inspired me to go to work. That's how I feel. Most definitely. Why does he inspire you to go to work? Cause I know if he out there getting plays, I know it. Like he inspired me to go out there and go and get. Tyree, how impressed are you that he dropped into the flat? Looked like a DB on his interception. How impressive is that? It's very impressive. Knowing James, like, you never know, like, he never limit himself. So, you know, like, with him, like, you never know what you're going to get. Terry, you've seen Nico a lot in practice. Just how long have you known what he can do on the football field? For a long time. I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew getting Nico that we, we get that guy for money, man. For real, for real. We got that guy. Seeing how well he played today, how do you think that, that sort of impacts next season? Nico, that is. Oh, we going to the net. Knowing him, we going to the net. You have that, right that, that, that much faith in, in what you've seen of him? A thousand percent. What about him gives you that faith? His ball awareness. Like everything about him lets you know that he's supposed to be here. I love that so much. And again, that will likely be the last time we hear from Tyree West in the media setting. Uh, man, a um, couple of things. I, I know I'm running behind here. You saw the way he lit up when he was talking about James Pierce. And his play. Well, they're friends, obviously. They go through it. They're teammates. They support each other. But also think about this. James Pierce is on one side of the line of scrimmage. The other side is Tyree West. Okay? If multiple offensive linemen and, and tight ends and running backs are paying attention to the human wrecking ball that is James Pierce, that's going to leave one-on-one -on -one matchups with Tyree West and others on that defensive line. Okay? You want to know why teammates root for pass rusher success? Because they make everybody better. I brought this up on the postgame pod the other night. Um... You know who made Robert Mathis's career? Mathis's. <laughs> Say that again. Math Robert Mathis, former Indianapolis Colt, Mathis's career. Dwight Freeney, because he was so dynamic on the other side. Again, that was awesome. Uh, saying the defensive line is going to be a nightmare in 2024. Love that quote. And then ask about Nico. Oh, we going to the natty. We going to the natty. Well, we will see. But uh, Tyree West was feeling himself as he should because he had such a phenomenal game in the Citrus Bowl. Hey, when we come back, we'll talk to Josh Ward. We'll ask him about the Citrus Bowl and what he thought. That has come up next right here as we continue with Locked on Vols. All right, FanDuel, it's America's number one sports book. The NFL regular season, it's wrapping up, right? But there's still time to get in on all that action over at FanDuel Sportsbook. It's America's number one sports book right now. New customers can get 150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. This app is so easy to use. There are so many different ways to bet, such as live same-game parlays. Uh, you can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make Parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best play for your po popular parlays, a whole lot more totals. You got the traditional spreads, individual player props. The app is super easy to use. If I can do it, you can do it as well. Get in on the action for the end of the regular season for the NFL playoffs. That's at FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bets a layup today. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. More to come here with Josh Ward on Locked On Balls. All right, guys, welcome back in your Thursday edition of Locked On Balls. It is Thursday. It's not Wednesday, but we did want to bring on Josh Ward because we haven't heard from him over, over the last couple of weeks. 
with the Christmas holidays. Josh, hope everything went well with the family over Christmas. Yeah, we had a great time. Kids had a blast during the Christmas holidays, and uh, they kind of extended it past New Year a little bit. So a uh, wonderful time. We're back to reality now, but uh, appreciate it. I hope the same for you. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And, um, you know, since we last spoke, obviously, Tennessee, a lot of news, right? Um, you know, Tennessee basketball has had a couple. No, Tennessee football, Joe Milton opts out. Nico Imaliava says, hey, I'm going to start. Goes in, four total touchdowns. Um, Tennessee just bulldozes Iowa 35 nothing in the Citrus Bowl your overall thoughts on Tennessee's win and then of, of course on Nico it was I think everything that Tennessee fans could have realistically hoped for going in the statistics that Nico put up are not going to wow everybody the yeah. the touchdowns are huge right but in terms of like his his passing yards his rushing yards there's nothing that's going to pop off the page there but if you watch the game and if you watch him run the offense and you see the way that his teammates responded to him, then you understand all the excitement around his potential. And that's really what it's about. What could he do in his debut as the starter to build on this offseason and improve on heading into his second year on campus? And I think he did everything that that anybody could have realistically asked for going in. And there was already so much hope and, and hype and just the news of him starting created this optimism about what could happen in the future. And then to have that kind of result and James Pierce Jr.'s performance on the defensive side to, I think, enhance how the game is viewed and how the game is going to be remembered over the next eight months helps as well. But uh, the, the Nico potential, I think, is real. I am a buyer in Nico stock, which is already at a very high price. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. you. You you look at the stats that you referenced, and I mean, you know, I, I've been calling it pedestrian because that's, that's what it was. 12 and 19, 151 yards, touchdown. There were a couple of drops in there. There was one route that I think Ramel Keaton just stopped running. And mm -hmm. if you were to catch that, man, that's that's blossoming to around 200 yards probably. But, you know, he didn't have to be Superman through the air. What I was impressed with is he just took what Iowa gave him. And with the struggles of, of keeping him protected up front, his ability to escape pressure, to run when needed, to extend plays, he was so in control of the offense. No pre-snap penalties. I was impressed just with his operation. And again, yep. you're a true freshman. That's your first start, but it is your first start. You can't hide that. But, you know, you, you've you been on campus for a year now. So to to a point that's not really, you know, that, that shocking that he can run the offense efficiently. Like you expect that now. But, you know, that stage against that defense, that was what I was most pleased with from Nico's performance. Yeah, that's why you have to dive deeper than the stats. And there's some stats that are just fine with what they were able to do. But, if you look at Tennessee during the regular season, statistically on average, the Vols fell below what they did game in, game out during the regular season in a lot of categories. Joe Milton's yards per game was higher than what Nico did. But a question I had going into the game, just looking at the matchup, was, okay, I was defense, I think, is solid, uh, at least. And in the red zone, they create problems for a team in Tennessee that had red zone issues at times on offense. But Nico's playmaking ability in the red zone, he scored three touchdowns himself before the fourth touchdown, which he threw there late. That's the playmaking that Tennessee will count on. The excitement of what Nico might be able to do as a playmaker with somebody like Dylan Sampson, who has already proven himself as a playmaker in Tennessee's offense. And then he had his first shot to carry a big workload. And that went really well with him rushing for more than 130 yards on 20 carries. That's something to build on. Others have to improve. I have questions about the receiving core still, even with what they've been able to add to the room. The offensive line needs to be better in 2024 than it was in 2023. These are all pretty obvious statements, I think. But Nico's ability to make plays, and as you're talking about, run the offense for the first time, being in charge against a fundamentally sound defense that has played good teams already, uh, that – uh, that is what Tennessee will build on. The fact that Nico's start went as I think they hoped and in some ways went better. You know, coming into the game, Iowa had given up 14 touchdowns on the year. Iowa had given up four rushing touchdowns on the year. The whole year completely shut down Michigan's rushing attack and Blake Corum. Mm -hmm. and Tennessee ran for 232. Nico ran for three touchdowns himself. So, again, I understand Iowa plays in a weak division and all that, but still the stats – 
are, are pretty pretty spectacular in a couple areas, and Tennessee kind of throttled them. Um, you look at James Pierce, you brought him up, man. He um mm-hmm. just fantastic, accounted for 14 points. Um, when I look at James Pierce on one side, Nico on the other side, it's not hard for me who covers Tennessee to be excited for 2024, but also if I'm a college football observer, you look at Tennessee, you're like, man, that team's got a lot of firepower, both offensively and defensively heading into 2024, a year with expanded college football playoffs where they're letting in 12 teams. Tennessee's goal next season will be to get to the playoff. I'm sure they'll yeah. be talking about winning the SEC championship and all of that, but to get to the 12 team playoff will be a goal high up on the list for Tennessee and it will be a realistic goal for Tennessee. Those two players you're talking about will go into the 24 season as real candidates to be the offensive and defensive players of the year. Pierce is more established. He had a terrific second season. He is just he, he's an absurd athlete with what he's able to do in different places on the football field as we saw with his pick six that he uh, put up against Iowa. You know, it's funny when I talk about the statistics that were kind of lacking for Nico or the offense over the course of four quarters. Part of the issue was, well, one of the scoring drives was already set up for him in the yep. inside the five by Pierce, and then he has the pick six, so the ball just goes back to Iowa again. So you know, Pierce was taking away from some of the offensive opportunities in the second half, uh, and he helped, of course, blow out Iowa. So I'm joking there, but – Pierce is he's a monster on the field with his physical ability. And if he does improve and why shouldn't we expect him to, as we saw him make a huge jump from his first year where he was not a factor on the defense to being one of the best guys on the edge in the entire conference and really the nation in 2023, that's something to build on. Now, uh, having other guys back on the defensive line is also going to help. The question about the secondary will be there during the entire offseason. And then on the offensive side, I went through some of the other position groups where I still have questions, but building around James Pierce on defense and Nico on offense is a better starting position than most teams in college football. Yeah. Most things you, you, you could hope to be at. And so, um, you know, Tennessee's rolling on in 2024, nine and four, a 35 to nothing win over Iowa in the citrus bowl, uh, a pretty good way to finish the 23 season. Now, you know, there, there's no rest for the weary. The transfer portal is open for a couple of days. The new, mm-hmm rule that says transfers can transfer again you gotta watch out for some of these transfers maybe a gerald mincy maybe a dante thornton as the week goes on but brew mccoy did make his announcement that he is coming back to tennessee and man i was i said on yesterday's show going into the season i was high on tennessee's running back room and wide receiver room running back room proved to be right wide receiver room proved to be wrong i guess i overestimated replacing the blitnikoff award winner and another third round pick. But you look at this room for next year right now. I mean, you got Brew McCoy. You bring in Chris Brasley, who I think is going to be a really good player. Dante Thornton is there. Squirrel White, of course, in the slot. Uh, you got Chaz Nimrod and Caleb Webb, who have gotten a lot of PT this year. And then you throw in Mike Matthews. You throw in Braylon Staley. This wide receiver room, along with Brew McCoy, can be some serious weapons for Nico in 2024. Brew McCoy coming back is really important news for Nico. I think the room should be better than what we saw in 2023. It feels like a pretty safe statement. My question is, what is the overall potential? Do they have enough consistent playmakers at receiver to help Nico? And part of that is the question because while Brazel did really well at Tulane, we still have to see what he can do at Tennessee. He comes in with more proven ability, I think, on the field than Dante Thornton did a year yeah. ago. Thornton came in with, yeah, he made a few plays. He had a, a big average. Uh, and what he did catching the football against Oregon, but we hadn't seen proven production and also him playing in the slot just didn't seem like the right fit as the season went along. Uh, So Brazel comes in with, with more proven on his resume. Now he has to do it in a tougher conference in the sec. And then Matthews and Staley have a ton of potential. I wonder what kind of opportunity will they get as freshmen? How can other players improve? These are all questions that they'll have a chance to answer. So I'm not ready to say that Tennessee will be where it was in 2022 when Jalen Hyatt was playing the way that he was or when they started out the season with somebody like Cedric Tillman, who is an NFL wide receiver. But there is plenty of potential in this group. And that's before I mentioned players performing. I think one of the most disappointing players from the 23 class in year one would be Nathan Laycock. He's a guy that rose up in recruiting rankings but made 
no impact even when Tennessee yeah. dealt with injuries as the season went along. Is he somebody that gets a, a chance to do more? Can he improve? So players have a chance to prove that they can do more. The year three guys, Caleb Webb and Chaz Nimrod, you know, what, what happens for those guys next? These are all questions that they'll have a chance to answer a little bit in the spring when we see them out there. But of course, it's really eight months away from them being able to prove themselves. If, you know, if Dante Thornton is for sure back and playing on the outside for Tennessee, he has to be motivated to show that yeah. he's a better player than he was the previous season. And he wants to go to the NFL, I'm sure. So uh, Squirrel White is a guy that can make plays. Can he be more consistent in doing that? Uh, the offensive line, how good that is, will also play a role in this conversation. Also, if you're back and you're Dante Thornton and you're playing, I mean, you're, you've got Chris Brazel right there on your heels. I mean, you know, Correct. Brazel is going to play some. It was know, handed to Dante this past yeah. season, his opportunity, and it won't yeah. be in 2024. Yeah, Brew's going to be the other receiver. So, I mean, again, they're going to be some fighting for some reps there. Uh, you know, it's a new year. A lot is going to say the same. You and Jason Swain still nine to, or noon to 3 on 99.1 The Sports Animal, the Josh and Swain newsletter, about 8.30 every Friday morning. It's a free download. Uh, you can hit that link up in the description of the show. So, a lot stays the same, but something that's new, the Josh and Swain you know, radio show is going to be simulcasted up in the Sports Monster in the Tri-Cities area beginning, what is that, January the 8th? Yeah, so coming up on Monday, and uh, appreciate you sharing that news. Yeah. We're excited. Uh, that's our cumulus station up there in the tri city So for all the Locked On Vols listeners, viewers that are in that area, you can check us out live on the radio on the Sports Monster, just as the Eric Ains show will finish off. We'll take over there at noon. So we're very excited about that, continuing to try to grow in what we're doing with radio, video, the newsletter, still trying to grow that as well. So joshandswain.com or the link that Eric provides, if you can subscribe to that, it's free. Would appreciate it. But uh, thanks to all the listeners and people who checked out what we were doing in 2023, and we're going to do more in 2024. So listen to him on the radio. Give him a follow on X. That is Josh underscore Ward. Josh, as always, man, thanks so much. Thanks, Eric. All right, that is Josh Ward here on Award Wednesday on a Thursday as we kind of you know bring our Thursday uh, to a close. Guys, appreciate it. Thanks so much for being here, making Lockdown Balls your first listen. We will come back on Friday. We will tie a bow on this week. It's been a busy week. It's been a fun week, and I appreciate you guys for being here every step of the way. Starting off the new year here with Lockdown Balls. Can't thank you enough. Until then, uh, you guys enjoy the rest of your Thursday. This is Lockdown Balls.